It's another edition of the KSO Show brought to you by People's State Bank and Legacy Insurance. We're at Tallgrass Tap House. And, on a Tuesday. Uh, on a Tuesday. Hey, we have our new intern running the board for <laughs> me, too. This is kind of different. Like, I'm just, I'm on a mic. Nothing but a mic this time. And I could probably be really bad because I'm not used to change. Whatever makes your job easier. But Logan Mance. <laughs> Logan That's Mance. That's it is right there. I love it, man. Get your voice on this show every week. And, uh, you'll Hopefully. be great. Yeah. <laughs> you'll be better than me. But it's a, it's a thing where I, it's good and bad, right? Because in theory, you should be better now because you're not, you're not, you're not splitting duties. Yep. And Logan's helping you out. But what if you're not? Like, what if you're as bad as ever on the pod oh, and Logan's running the board for you? Then... I mean, then like, I either got to learn how to get better or just go back to running the board. Right. We can put, you, <laughs> exactly, put you on the board, Logan on the pod. That's I mean, all it is. That's all yeah. it's got to be. Should we introduce the guy for the first time this year? Derek. The, other than Logan, who's also for the Derek first time. Derek Young, first time on a preview pod. Present. What's up, UI? Present. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and Dale Hall. Matt Hall yep. with us. And it's a fun one. This So it's Tuesday, which might sound weird because we're releasing this late Thursday night to go up on the site Friday morning. So we might say a few things like it's today. We'll try our best to say, oh, it's on Tuesday. Uh, maybe we heard from coaches and stuff because we did hear from Coach Kleiman today and a few players. Right. Um, but mainly we're going to preview the Mississippi State football game and maybe take a look back a little bit here and there at what we saw from the first two games of the season. Exactly. I mean, the thing I would add, too, is we, it's Tuesday. We'll meet with players and yep. assistants the next two days, meaning Wednesday and Thursday point is there may be something we've learned between the time of this pod recording and you listening to it you might say well they've already told me that white hubert's playing and now they're saying they're not sure so just remember we recorded this tuesday if we reported something on the site you know wednesday thursday friday it is fresher than this podcast absolutely so uh first is there anything from today you heard before we get to start and go position by position you want to talk about from climbing and players yeah i think from a just a general sense everyone expects and naturally is going to ask a lot of questions and i would have too about how big of a game this is and what kind of an opportunity it is to prove things and in kind of the cliche, you know, big picture stuff you hear so much. And I really believed that Chris Kleiman and, and the players today uh, were not interested in that stuff, not in a rude way or not in a dismissive way, but you expect to hear it's just a regular week. You expect they're going to say those things, whether you believe them or not, it's a different thing. And I don't know what Derek would say, but for me, I bought it. Like, I, I bought that they were treating this like a regular Tuesday prep, regular Wednesday prep, regular week. I'm sure they'll be excited on Saturday at a different level than they were so far this season, but I don't think they do feel that different right now. Yeah, I think it was just business as usual. Uh, they even said, you know, even if there was a little – additional energy in the football complex i mean they just felt it was the same energy it's been high energy all season so not a whole lot of difference between this week and even preparing for nickels uh the energy is the same and they're just they're preparing just like it was you know week one and week two so we saw two big wins from k-state in their first two non-conference games and now leading up to mississippi state headed to starksville we're heading down there friday morning Let's talk about position by position, Dale, just like we have on every single right. preview pod so far. Start us off with quarterback and what you saw from the first two games. Um, not just Skylar Thompson, but yeah, we saw enough from Holcomb and Oz to even have a little analysis there. That's true. We can talk more, I mean, than we could in the past about the backups and, and uh, specifically. Skylar Thompson, I thought, was very good again in week two. I thought he was sharper in week one, even though the numbers are very similar. You know, 16 of 22 in week one, 10 of 13 in week two. Week one, a few drops, and in week two, guys were making a lot more plays for him. Yeah. So I thought he was still good Saturday. Don't get me wrong. I think PFF gave a 93.1, which is another great grade. I think he leads the nation in QBR. So I'm not going to sit here and just, you know, dog on Skylar Thompson for making Malik Knowles make two good catches in that game. Mm -hmm. um, he's been very, very good so far. So I think the story will be, and we'll get more into this. I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, I think he's going to need to have a huge game for K-State to have a chance to beat Mississippi State, bigger than he's had so far from a yeah. yardage perspective. Um, but I think he's been very, very good. And then I'll be interested to hear Derek's thoughts on this too. But you saw John Holcomb play, you know, uh, in a close game still. You know, in the first half of that game in his package, that really surprised me. He fumbled, you know, on the on the, on the the snap the first play and came off. We didn't really see him run that package again. I thought Nick Ost was very, very good in his only drive. So I think it seemed like going into Saturday or during Saturday's game, Derek, that Nick Cost had been passed by John Holcomb. But then the results of that game on Saturday may, may, may make a person feel better about Nick Ost again. Yeah, and I wonder if, 
he was actually passed up where they're trying to be mindful of what the quarterback room and the dynamics of it are, uh, keeping John Holcomb, like they said, engaged, but I think also content and happy to where there's maybe, you know, not a little, you know, drama there to keeping him uh, and allowing him to practice with a purpose still, too. And one and of those guys, like yourself, I'll just say it, I'll just cut in and, and say it bluntly, one of those guys is a redshirt freshman scholarship player right. that I want a sophomore walk on. So yep. now they don't care about both. But yeah, yeah. And so you know that matters, and and I would I would say that even though that package didn't necessarily work because he went in there for a meaningful snap and then he dropped the snap, of course, and lost yardage. If you read between the lines of what James Gilbert had to say too, it sounds like there is a clear and defined package of plays that they've created around John Holcomb. So I won't say you won't see it again, but it, I doubt you'll see it against Mississippi State. Though I didn't think that we'd see it as early as we already have this season. Absolutely. Let's move on to running back. I'm going to list off six guys' names, and then you guys can talk about all six. James Gilbert, Jordan Brown, Harry Trotter, Tyler Burns, Jarkadia Wright, and Joe Irvin have all seen the field in the backfield for running back position. I think all, all of them have had some success as well, but take me through that position, Dale. You're right. There's not a single one that you can at least find a highlight from out of that group, and some of them a number of highlights. Yeah. Uh, maybe me and Derek will trade back and forth, and yeah. I'll start. I'll start with. I'm going to start with Jordan Brown because I'm a Jordan Brown guy. I love James Gilbert too; has a great attitude. He mm-hmm. runs really hard. But Jordan Brown is. I don't think this staff is a big believer in the cliche holding stuff back and and you know, holding back tricks and that kind of thing because they they know that's not a real thing necessarily in football on a, at a big level. But if they are doing it, my suspicion is it's maybe it's Jordan Brown. Only got six carries last week. Had a 50-yard touchdown very early in the game, and then virtually didn't play again after that. He mm-hmm. got a couple snaps, but I just have some suspicion that Derek and I have talked a lot about how is Casey going to make big plays on offense, and I think the most capable guy is Jordan Brown. Um, so I still think James Gilbert will see he'll start. He'll probably see the most carries, and deservedly so against Mississippi State. But I'll be looking for Jordan Brown this week, Derek. Yeah, and James Gilbert. Uh, Probably, probably isn't an argument. I think he's been the best back, yeah. at least the most complete back the first two weeks and certainly deserving of a starting mm-hmm. nod. And a lot of that probably goes back to him just being more comfortable with the system than most of the other backs that, you know, that they do have in their arsenal. He's played longer, not only because he's a transfer and a senior and, and got considerable playing time while at Ball State, but just because he was here in spring football, that's probably what ultimately elevated him mm-hmm. above Jordan Brown and still has him there. And I think, maybe not a surprise, but I think that the thing that's taken us most aback by him and what he's done so far is just his ability to run through tackles. And now maybe it was opponent dependent. They didn't. They haven't played a power five opponent yet with elite athleticism or, or talent necessarily. Mm-hmm. But I kind of think that's a little bit of a skill that you still have to have, and he certainly has it. I agree with all that. I'll go on to Harry Trotter yeah. then next. I thought Harry Trotter in game one was far better than I gave him credit for being or, or going into that. The touchdown run he had, like I've said this before, but five different Nichols defenders touched him on that play, and he ran by all of them and ran through all of them and scored. Um, in a rewatch of the Bowling Green game, I thought he struggled a little bit. I think he looked a little bit more like the back I kind of expected coming into the season. Um, went down a little bit at first contact. Was it creating a lot? The speed wasn't as apparent against an FBS defense. So if I'm being blunt, what I would be surprised if I don't see on Saturday is, you know, you were seeing maybe maybe something like 40% of the snaps going to Gilbert, you know, and then the other 30 and 30, not counting the other guys, which you have yeah. to count too, going to Trotter and Brown. I'd be surprised if that doesn't become 50% Gilbert, 40% Brown, and yeah. then 10% Trotter and other guys because I, I just question if – if his speed and athleticism will translate against Mississippi State mm-hmm. the way Jordan Browns and Jane Gilberts will, in my opinion. And I'll probably going to surprise, I'll probably jump to Jacardia right at this yeah, point because uh, although just a true freshman, although he just played his first game, I, I think that even though Chris Kleiman said the quantum leap was made by Jack Stenine, probably from week one to week two, that, that is probably fair. But in terms of just making a big leap from the point that they arrived on campus until now, that's probably owned by Jacardia Wright. Uh, He didn't arrive at the same time as most of the true freshmen. He didn't arrive, you know, for spring football. He didn't arrive for the summer. So he hasn't been here hardly long at all, and he's already cracked into the rotation to the point where he got it running back snaps while Skylar Thompson was still the quarterback in the game. 
and it's an easy excuse to say, well, we were just wanted to see what Jacardi Wright could do. We threw him in the fire instead of Tyler Burns. Tyler Burns didn't get that treatment even in week one when he played. He didn't get snaps at running back while Skylar Thompson was still the quarterback. So I think an argument could be made that Jacardi Wright might be the fourth running back. And probably a good bold prediction is he could crack into the top three before the season's over. I think they like him that much. I bet Derek's right, and I'll use that as a way to segue into Tyler Burns mm-hmm. because the reason, you know, to play a running back by committee, uh, you shouldn't do it just to do it. You know, I mean, you would hopefully be playing guys because they offer something unique. You know, if one guy's better, you just play him the whole time. I mean, you can't do that because of fatigue. But the point I'm getting to is, I think Derek's right. Jacardi are right. Jacardier right, excuse me, he's mm-hmm. like Cartier Jod. I gotta I work know. on that. Right. Um, he does offer something. He's the physically biggest of those guys. Mm-hmm. He also has the least wiggle. I mean, yeah. at this point, no wiggle in his running game, but they want him probably to run, you know, the more A gap stuff right up the middle of the field and to be physical. That's what Tyler Burns kind of offered too. And so you're not gonna play both of them. I mean, you can, of course, but there's no reason to. They offer a similar thing. So if you have Gilbert, who's your every down and back, you know, Brown, who's your explosive guy in the passing game, then you're looking for a power back, you're not gonna play two of them. You're going to play one. And I, I think Derek's right. I think it could be Jacardier right? Tyler Burns was good in week one. I don't think he's done. He's still a young player, too. And we're not mm-hmm. saying that. But, yeah, I think as it is right now, he's probably behind uh, Jacardier right in the pecking order. Yeah, and I think Tyler Burns – and I, I thought this going into the season, despite what he did in week one, I think his big, uh, biggest offering for this program, at least this year and next year, I think is probably going to be in special teams, and there's nothing wrong with that. And though they are alike, and that, that's their – and I agree with that, Jacardi Wright and Tyler Burns. What might be pushing Jacardi Wright ahead of him, too, is they are the same running back, but Wright is far more explosive and faster, I think, in just the, the limited snapshots that we did see between the two. And the last running back is Joe Irvin. Yeah. Uh, at one point, he was ahead of Jacardi Wright, and he was probably you know, maybe in line to be that third or fourth running back. I don't think it's anything that he's done to necessarily regress. I think you know Jacardi Wright just put... Uh, you know, just surged ahead. Mm-hmm. It was more him progressing quicker than Joe Irvin regressing. But he shows, you know, probably nothing distinguishing about him at this point. Probably haven't seen him enough. But obviously he's someone that they like and, and that they think has a big future for him to be already seeing the field. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so, yeah, Jarkady, you're right. Don't expect a, uh, a red shirt to go on him. But Joe Irvin, you probably do expect the red shirt. I would agree. Yeah, yeah um, I think right now. Yeah, at, at this point. So let's move on to fullback and tight end. Um, let's start with Derek this time and, and tell, take me through what you've seen from, from the number of guys. Obviously, Jack Stanine has, has stepped up big time. Another true freshman that you probably don't expect, or they've already said they're not going to redshirt him. So take me through what you've seen from him, Mason Barta, and, and uh, Leonard's from that position. Yeah, the, obviously fullback and tight ends and the H's are all pretty interchangeable. Uh, some of the fullbacks won't play tight ends. Some of the tight ends won't, won't play fullback, but still a lot of them, especially Nick Lenners, have that versatility to do a, uh, a lot of the things asked for each of the three spots. Jack Stanine, I already kind of hinted at it. Head coach Chris Kleiman said in his uh, teleconference on Monday, made a quantum leap from game one to game two. Now, I didn't think he played all that poorly in game one. He was uh, certainly showed that he was a true freshman, but it wasn't terrible. But uh, I would agree with Chris Kleiman. If you re- go back and rewatch the tape with a lot of detail and and you're thorough about it, you'll see the big jump that Jack Stanine mm-hmm. made from game one to game two. And probably just the, the big jump that Kansas State was ma- able to make at the fullback position from game one to game two because of him. Because he wasn't just you know, going in there and popping the guy and standing them up as the, as the lead blocker in run plays. When he was the lead blocker in run plays, he was getting a considerable push. There, there's multiple plays you can go back and watch the film where Jackson Neen, as soon as he made contact, he didn't stop there. He would drive that defender a good at least five to seven yards. So his blocks were just a little bit more devastating, a little bit more punishing, and therefore a lot more effective. Uh, Mason Barta, it, I, I don't think I saw a really discernible difference for him between game one and game two. We noted on the site uh, before the game uh, that you know perhaps Jackson Eam would start to chew into his snaps, uh, and that started to happen. Uh, Mason Barta, I think, had about 15 snaps compared to Deneen's three uh, in game one, and then the second game we saw that I think the difference was 11 to six. So it's starting to uh, the gap's starting to be closed between those two. I was going to praise Derek for a second um, if you read the final walkthrough, which started new last week. It's something Derek released. It's kind of at the point when, you know, there's no real teams looking at media stuff anymore mm-hmm. late Friday, early Saturday. Uh, I, he, he let you know that their gap had closed between those two, and I even thought maybe Jackson e would start yeah. that game. But the, the, 
the difference in snaps like Derek referenced, you know, kind of proved what's happening there. Now I'd probably be especially surprised if he doesn't start Saturday, or whether they start a fullback or not. Mm-hmm. If he's not the first true fullback to play, but, you know, staying in that position. For me, the Titans will be fascinating this week because I think they've played well, obviously, when you've run for 360 and 330 yards. There's a lot of guys doing the job, and those tight ends are mm-hmm. blocking all the time. Derek's noticed how much success K-State has on the field when Logan Long's on the field at tight end. Um, he's been really good. But what I'm trying to get to is I'm curious, will this be the week where we see a guy like Nick Lenners, um, probably him out of all of them, get three, four, or five catches? Because as I said earlier, and I'll probably keep getting back to I think it's a game where if K-State's going to win, it's probably not going to be Skylar Thompson going 10 of 15 throwing the football. It's probably going to take a little bit more of that. And I still think Nick Lenners is one of their best options in the passing game. Um, And I'm not criticizing them for not using that because they've been great so far. But if we don't see this be a game where that position gets three, four, five catches, then maybe it won't be as big of a focus in the passing game Mm -hmm. as I would have guessed. But I suspect it might. And um, maybe more than any, I'll be excited to see what that group does in a game where they're going to need them to do more than just block. Yeah, two things. And I agree with you on the the, involving the tight ends in the passing game. I think some of the, you know, reasons for them not being as, you know, used in in that phase of the game has been that, you know, most of the first, at least the plays that they've run so far, I think most of the first reads have been mm-hmm. kind of outside to the receivers. And because of the opponent, those reads have been open. Right. So we haven't got, gotten to, you know, having to use Lenners or Blaze Gammon as pass catchers, even though they're, they, they might be open, you know, because they just haven't been the first or second read and they haven't had to go to them. The other thing is I don't think it's being told enough. Not only is Logan Long lined up as a tight end this year, he's lined up in the fullback as a backfield. So they literally have a 285-pound player in their backfield this season. We're number 85. (laughs) You don't see it a lot at fullback or H-back or whatever. So, yeah. But he's been very, very good. And Derek talked about him in the past. He's a guy who played tackle at some point. That's still absolutely possible. But um, he's he's a... A what sort I'm looking for a significant player on the team right now yeah. at tight end. Yeah, and I, don't, I, I doubt offensive tackles is likely anymore because he's right. proving to be a good player in his uh, current role. Let's talk about the receiver position, and obviously you brought up a little bit about Skylar Thompson going into Mississippi State. Tell me, like, what you think Skylar Thompson can do with some of these receivers going into Mississippi State. Malik Knowles obviously right. showed some really good stuff go, uh, last game. Shown kind of went missing last game, but. These are guys he's going to have to rely on coming on Saturday. He is. You know, Dalton showed out a big touchdown last year against Mississippi State. That was really K-State's only big offensive play of the game. Malik Knowles, as you referenced, was fantastic last week. You know, PFF scores, I, I say it every time. You can, They're not perfect. You know, it doesn't mean a player played exactly like this. But he had a 93-2, just higher, mm-hmm. just higher than Skyler. They went back and changed the grades. They were tied at 93-1 for a little while, and they went back and bumped up uh, Knowles one-tenth, one-one-hundredth of a point. Uh, more and then a couple of grades changed too. It was funny, but uh, the the point is, it's I think it's going to have to be those guys. The challenge now is going to be Mississippi State specifically is very big in the yeah. secondary. You know, uh, compared to most teams, K State's not particularly been the secondary. So guys like Lance Robinson, Walter Neal, AJ Parker, Kevion McGee, Daryl Patterson, the guys that have been going up against practice are not similar. Maybe they're similar quality. That's a whole different conversation. But they're not similar players. What Mississippi State has so. Um, Skylar Thompson is going to have to be accurate because the defensive backs from Mississippi State are, again, bigger and longer. Mm-hmm. So the receiver group's going to have to step up and play uh, one of its best games of the year for K-State to have a chance, I think. And like like you mentioned, I think um, I think Dalton Schoen has to probably step up and play not as well as he played at Texas two years ago, but it's yeah. going to take somebody playing like that, I think, for K-State to have a shot. I would agree. And, and that's probably Malik Knowles, at least you, you hope it is. because Even on one of his touchdowns, the slap pass out against Bowling Green, it wasn't a great ball by Skylar Thompson. Mm-hmm. And he still was able to come down with it. I think that was the fourth down play. Yeah. Uh, but so. either way, he has to get those 50-50 balls, especially in a game of this magnitude, uh, for them to be able to beat a team you know, of this caliber mm-hmm. just because – because their secondary is so much bigger, so much longer, their their defensive line will probably get a little bit more pressure on the quarterback. Those windows are just going to be so much tighter in this game. So uh, I don't know how much it's going to be on the receivers, 50-50 balls, but Skyler is really going to have to have that pinpoint accuracy that we saw more of in week one rather than week two. Yeah. Let's move on to offensive line. This is where we can also go back to the running backs a little bit and talk about how well do you think – this line opens up holes, or do they struggle to run the ball against this tough Mississippi State defense? More than anything, that's what we're going to learn this week. I mean, we can sit here and talk about every position group because they will all teach us something this week. But that's my question. You know, I, I, I've i tried. I don't think I've been critical of what K-State's accomplished. It's impossible to. Yeah. I've been really, really impressed. But I, if I'm being totally honest, can they line up and just run right at a, a, you know, a Power 5 SEC good defensive, you know, top 25 football team 
anywhere near like they've done against you know Nichols mm-hmm. and Bowling Green. I don't expect them to. It's unreasonable to. They could be successful without running for a school record, yeah. you know, of yards against Mississippi State. The defensive line's not as good. You know, Sweat's gone, Simmons is gone, but they're still talented. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know the answer. You know, I mean that group got dominated last year yep. by Mississippi State's defensive line. And a lot of guys, Adam Holtorf, Tyler Mitchell, Josh Rivas, uh, who am I forgetting? Um, Scott France, of course, yeah. you know, played against that group, yep. and they got dominated last year. Um, I know they're going to play really, really hard. They look like different linemen. Like Adam Holtorf was just destroying people last week in a physical manner he didn't do at all last year. So I have some faith they can be better and will be better. But that's the question. That's going to, you know, I'll talk about Skyler and all that kind of stuff. The game will come down to can the line be similar to them in the last few weeks if they have they may win if it can't it'll be a long day and it'll, it'll probably go a long way the mississippi state just isn't that same defensive front uh they'll probably just have as much talent and athleticism that's the way they've yeah. they've recruited but uh the experience isn't there and the experience this time will be on kansas state side whereas i don't think it was last year or at least it was pretty even in that regard so having you know, over 100 returning starts on this offensive line that remembers getting their tail whipped last year should, you would think, you know, provide a little bit of a boost in this game and it'll probably, you know, be important to start fast because if you get, you know, get get your face smashed in, you know, mm-hmm. that first and second drive, then you start to wonder, okay, here we go again. So I think a, a fast start will probably be pretty ample in this game and, and you got to wonder, you know, Scott France, hopefully, you know, that shoulder isn't giving him enough problems at this point either. Let's flip to the other side of the ball, unless you want Defense. to talk about two. I mean, did you guys bring up, like, what's the line going to look like for pass blocking, too, for Skyler? I don't know if, I, if we really talked about that. I you, mean, I would say I would share a similar thing. I think they yeah. were better They were better pass blocking than run blocking last yeah. year, but not by a significant amount. Even Skyler Thompson in Tuesday's press conference was talking at the end about getting hit quite a bit as he, as he threw. So I, I don't know that I'm as concerned for that challenge. Because I think guys like France and Holtorf and Mitchell, even mm-hmm. last year when they weren't great blocking for the run, they weren't giving up yeah. pressures. Yep. So I, I think they'll be okay protecting the passer. My concern is more about creating you know holes in the running running game, which, again, may be ridiculous considering they've run for 700 yards yeah. in the first two games. And I would agree with that. But, and it's more important for them to be able to run the ball because that's what everything comes off of when the way they, they their offense functions. Let's, now let's flip to the other side of the ball. Now you can say defense. Defense. <laughs> Tell me about Mississippi State's offensive line and what is uh, K State's defensive line going to do against this SEC offensive line? It's a physically huge unit. I mean, you're going to be, you know, where you see K State's across the front. I don't have the averages right in front of me, but K State probably averages more in the, hey, thank you very much, more in like the 6'4, you know, 3'10, 3'15 range a little bit. Mississippi State's more in the 6'5, 340 to 350 range across the front. And as bad as, you know, the D line got beat, excuse me, as bad as the O line got beat last year with Mississippi State, the D line, as Derek has, you know, written and told you a number of times, it was way worse for them. I mean, I, the K State's defense tackles were com- the same guys who were playing this week, you know, Jordan Mitty, uh, Trey Deshaun, Joe Davies got washed out yeah. by that offensive line last year. I don't think that'll happen again. I'm not predicting that to happen again. Um, I think K-State will play significantly better, but um, it was really, really rough last year. In a Power 5 versus Power 5 opponent game, I'm not sure I've seen one unit get dominated as much as the Kansas State defensive line did a year ago. I would and agree. That, and that might be putting it nicely. It was yeah. worse than against Oklahoma. Like uh-huh. There was plays where Way the, worse. the defensive I mean, line ended up on a sideline. That's how much they got moved off the ball. And if your defensive line's on a sideline, there's nothing in the middle of the field. That's why Kylan Hill ran for days. So uh, there's probably – they probably can't get worse, to, be, to put it to put it nicely. Yeah. And so I would, and I imagine they will get better because, and it's a good sign. Last week, though, against Bowling Green, I thought it was Jordan Mitty's best game in a Kansas State jersey. Yeah, and while we've been critical, I would just echo that too. Like it's going to be better. We don't throw all that saying it's going to happen again. We're just trying to say, hey, like it could be a lot better and still be not a huge edge for K State because this is going to be a good group. Kylan Hill's still there running behind that offensive line. I mean, last year, I don't have the numbers again right in front of me, but Nick Fitzgerald hit on something like 40% of his throws, had no consistency in the passing yep. game, and they still rolled up almost 600 yards, maybe over 600 of offense in that game. So, yeah, it's going to be a huge challenge. Deshaun and Mitty played great last week. I think they'll play well this week, and I think they'll make some plays, but it's a big challenge. Yeah, not only did Kylan Hill have over 200 yards rushing, if, and I think I have this right, I think Fitzgerald ran for 174 himself. Yeah, and Kylan so, Hill averaged over 10 yards carry in that game, too. So it was it was, it was was bad. I don't know if it's a good line, but over under 150 yards for Kylan Hill. I'll say under right now. I think, and you know, we'll get to the score and stuff, too. I, I think it'll be uh, not a super low-scoring game, but less offense than for Mississippi State we saw last year. Mm-hmm. I think K-State... 
Because, one, they're going to key on him. And I think K-State's defensive minds are smart enough to probably take away most any one thing they key on. Yeah. Um, so I'd be surprised if he got to 150. Yeah, I would say he's going to get over 100. But 100, so 100, 150 is a big number, and I would go under because I think they'll be okay with Mississippi State winning this game and moving the ball as long as it's not Kyle and Hill doing it. Let's move to, move to the linebacker group and talk about what, I mean, I, I think – has Daquan Batten been the most impressive linebacker so, so far in the well, first two games? I mean, Elijah Sullivan has been solid, but I don't know. I mean, and Daniel Green well, has been good, say. too. So it, it has been Patton for me. We'll see what Derek says. But I think the one you consider would be Daniel Green. Um, I, I think Patton because he's been very, very good, but those are the two that have been most impressive to me so far. Green was definitely a huge jump in the Bowling Green game. We'll put it right. that way. From so He made the biggest jump from week one to week two. Sullivan has probably just been, you know, Nothing great, but nothing bad. He's mm-hmm. just, you know, yeah. played decent games week one and week two. And Daquan Patton seems like a different guy compared to last season. So I think that's what's really promising about this unit is there really isn't some negatives that are – there's some negatives with the front four. Have it got, you know, pressure as much as they want. Wyatt Hubert's a little banged up right now. Reggie Walker still hasn't flashed the way you would like. But with the linebacker unit, even though – Maybe Elijah Sullivan hasn't popped or made the plays that it, or some you know staying out plays like I thought he was capable of. There's just really no negatives, and they've only had three linebackers play, which this is probably the shortest rotation of any positional unit they have on their team. They've done nothing but good things this year, yeah. and I've been very critical of that unit. Daquan Patton has played very, very, very well. I think better than his PFF scores even suggest, and they've been way better than last year. Um, so I, I'm very impressed with this group too. But yeah, like Derek said, there's there's still just three guys. You know, Cody Fletcher has been injured, hasn't played. He's probably 50 50 ish for this weekend. Um, either way, that's a tough way to debut against this offense. So, you know, similar to the offensive line and the defensive line and every group that's getting tested because this is the first real test. But man, these linebackers are going to be tested by this running game a ton. Last year, they didn't even have a chance. And I'm not yeah. going to pick on the defensive tackles, defensive line again, but they didn't even have a chance nope. because the entire Mississippi State offensive line was getting to the second level and blocking five on two against those guys. But this year, they're probably going to have an opportunity. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to make plays. This will be the game where we'll find out how bad will K-State's depth, depth hurt them or will it not? Like how much better is Daquan Patton? If those questions are all answered the way they have in the first two weeks, uh, K-State defensively has a real shot against Mississippi State because I think there's some questions at quarterback and in the passing game for them. With the caliber of the opponent you know, raising exponentially in this game, I do wonder if Elijah Sullivan is the one who needs to have the big game in this one because from a quickness, athleticism standpoint, I think we all would agree that he probably has the most of it among those three. I agree. Let's talk about the defensive backs. I mean, I don't think Tommy Stevens for Mississippi State has been super impressive but also not making a bunch of mistakes. What, are the, what do you think about the defensive back group going up against this passing attack? Yeah, I mean, and that's the question, too. And, again, as we're doing this on Tuesday, there's no real information. The Mississippi State depth chart you know, lists Tommy Stevens as the starter, but they say he's kind of day-to-day. They played a true freshman for the first time ever last week against Southern Miss, I think it was. And I'll pronounce his name wrong, but is it Keaton? Keaton spelled like Key? Keaton Thompson. Keaton Thompson, yeah, the backup they had last year who also played in the bowl game. He had some issues with going to the transfer portal and then coming back, and he was on the sideline last week but didn't play for him. He was suspended. I, I mean, yeah. yeah, so I, I this is guessing. I think you'll see either Stevens, the Penn State transfer, or Thompson. I don't think they'll have to go to the true freshman they did this week, but those are two totally different players. Yeah. Uh, yes, but the defensive backs, though, you know, this group playing the kind of the big nickel they do, they don't call it that, but that's what it really is with Jared McPherson as a safety play in the corner. This is a game where it could really pay off, you know, and guys like Jonathan Alexander playing at safety, too. I think that group's going to be key. The safeties, where this Wayne Jones, Goolsby, Jaron McPherson in the slot and the nickel, Jonathan Alexander coming up supporting the run game because if you're only playing two linebackers, that's going to be key. Mississippi State, very big at wide receiver, like they are at corner. Um, Isaiah Zuber at you know six foot, two hundred five pounds or so is one of their smaller receivers. So they'll be challenged with size, but I'm not that scared of yeah. the Mississippi State passing game, to be quite honest with you. Though. That's what I was going to say. There is a size differential. I'm not convinced that there's a big talent differential right. between Kansas State's secondary and Mississippi State's receiver. I could get totally proved wrong when this game tra- transpires on Saturday, but I don't, I don't think this is a unit that's going to burn them or anything like that. What we'll see is – do, can they make the plays on the 50-50 balls? That's what it'll come down to because I don't think this is a receiving unit that's going to be open all day or anything like that. And and maybe it will be when kids take gears towards more of the run. Maybe they'll be susceptible to it. I don't know. But it's just not a receiving unit that really scares me. And Tommy Stevens knows, even though he's been in Starkville for a very short amount of time, 
He has a really good understanding of the offense that Joe Moorhead wants to run. And he, Joe Moorhead was the offense coordinator at Penn State. More, uh, Tommy Stevens was in Penn State at that time. So uh, there, there isn't that learning curve necessarily. But we have a short sample size on him performing as a quarterback because I think he actually played a little slot back and receiver at Penn State before transferring to Mississippi State. And we just got to see him for a little bit before he got injured last week. So obviously this isn't a game you really have to analyze the cornerbacks and safeties too much because it's not the scariest passing attack. But I remember first game, you weren't super impressed with a guy like Walter Neal. Right. What would you think in uh, game I'll, two? I'll be honest, that's the guy who's coming to mind for me that I'm, maybe I'm thinking about. Uh, one, he got dinged up in game two. Could have come back, and I think he's healthy, and I'd, he'll start against Mississippi yeah. State. And Walter Neal's a good player. He knows what he's doing. But I, I'll be blunt. Like I think he's not been a very good tackler through his career. And while I'm not terrified of the passing game for Mississippi State, especially if Tommy Stevens isn't playing, uh, they're going to have to tackle on the edge against the running game. And I do worry about a guy like Kylan Hill against either A.J. Parker or yeah. Walter Neal. So I'm not saying they can't do it or won't do it. But Walter Neal in particular hasn't been incredibly consistent with it. So I think that's the biggest concern is how is that secondary going to play against the running game because they're going to be just as vital against that as they are probably against the pass. And the best tackler that K-State had on the perimeter the last two or three years has been Duke Shelley. Right, yeah. Don't have him anymore. Right. And then, what? Do, I mean, last thing on the DBs, what about Jonathan Alexander? Could you see him getting more minutes as a more imposing guy that can actually go in and get in the backfield and – you know? I really, I really can. I yeah. mean, you, you look and you look who you're going to pull off the field. You know, Goolsby's a senior, and Wayne Jones has been, you know, so praised, and I think played uh -huh. really, really well. And they both played well. Goolsby was in their top five PFF scores last week. But I think yes. I mean, I think it, it, this coaching staff has proven to have a great deal of common sense, for lack of a better term, because it's not easy to coach football. Yeah. Um, but about things like that, to where if, if there's a physical mismatch up front, Mississippi State. And they realize that. I think they'll go to their their safety, who's 6'3", 215, and runs well and probably try him more. And maybe they play what's kind of like a 4-3 with, you know, Alexander playing an out, really an outside linebacker, but mm -hmm. it's the nickel. Uh, I don't know. You know, I'm just yeah. rambling. I don't know the answer for sure, but I think it's absolutely something they'll, they will consider. And if it makes sense, they'll do it. It would be a, kind of a, a back and forth, too. We saw Jonathan Alexander quite a bit in game one, obviously. Right. With with the regular unit and defense last week, there was a lot less Jonathan Alexander. I think less than mm -hmm. I think only six or seven. It was snaps. less than the previous week. Yep. Yeah. So he 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 got a snaps cut in half. And I'm still kind of a believer in what they've been telling us because if you listen to the press conferences, 99.9 percent .9 of that stuff comes to fruition. So I do think it's probably game plan dependent or opponent dependent. And if that, that's the case, then what Matt says is true. Then we'll probably see Jonathan Alexander because he makes more sense in a ball game uh, against an opponent like this. And they may have genuinely yeah. believed, you know, because like Derek said, they've been so honest about so many things that Bowling Green was their last chance to throw out a group of 11 true freshmen. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I heard they said a similar thing maybe to Tyler Burns, and maybe they said a similar thing to you know Jonathan Alexander. Yeah. Like, hey, man, we're going to put Tyrone Lewis in, or hey, we're going to put Jacardier right. Um, or I think you know I think Landry, Landry Weber may have heard some of that about wide receivers. So if that's happening, and I suspect maybe it has, maybe we'd see Alexander Morgan this week, like Derek said. Let's move on to the special teams. I think a unit that's been up and down throughout both games. Uh, just take me through that whole entire unit. That's the thing, you know, I'm not trying to be an I told you so guy, but I'll say I told you so. Like, there was no way the unit wasn't going to get worse. Yeah. As people kind of pushed back on that, it wasn't me saying it can't still be good, and I think it's been good in some areas, but you can't go from having a dedicated special teams coordinator and spending more time on special teams than any team in the country, you know, by yeah. a huge margin, mm -hmm. to not having a special teams coordinator and just coaching special teams like everyone else does and not seeing some dip. Yep. So this should have been expected, and it's probably going to continue some throughout the season. That doesn't mean it should include multiple muff, you know, muff punts a game or miss short field goals like Blake Lynch in week one. I don't think it will. I think they'll be okay. I think those were some um, some one-off situations. But I don't think it's going to be a game-changing unit that wins games for K-State. I think the biggest thing they can hope for is guys like Lynch and Ankle just play really, really well at punter and kicker, and then the return game's a wash. Yeah, yeah. I think I said it in five points that released on the site would be Tuesday morning. But th this isn't going to be a phase of the game or unit where it wins games and – Though it was still doing that for Kansas State, even as you know, recent as last year, the year before, it's not common anymore in football. And I think we're getting back to what is common and where it's not going to win them any games. It certainly can lose them games if they make critical errors and mistakes, especially the ones that we saw in week one and week two. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. It's not going to win them a game, but it can certainly lose them a game. So they got to just uh, you know, at least eliminate the, the critical errors and the critical mistakes. And they certainly need to fix the kickoff because – if you score, you got to kick off. You got to figure yeah, that out. That's true. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, maybe it was just a case of them cycling through a bunch. You know, for, they some tried of that Zettner too. a little bit, and then yep. obviously Ankle's uh, game too. But uh, Philip Brooks also talked today about 
catching footballs as much as possible to make sure he doesn't muff a punt again. He seemed very confident. I believe it. I think he is too. And Chris Kleiman, man, I mean, he couldn't have said more, what's the word, you know, confidence Crazy and, 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 and yeah. inspiring things about Phillip Brooks mm-hmm. after Saturday's game than he did. And I wouldn't say I'm worried about it, but that would be a lie because I think I kind of am. Because mm-hmm. not only did Brooks put two on the ground, he, he caught two more that I thought he caught in an off-balance, awkward manner that he risked. So I thought four were at danger of getting yeah. left. I, I think he'll be fine. I would predict him to muff a punt, but I, I don't think it's – I don't know that that was – I'll say it this way. I think that will probably happen again at some point this mm-hmm. season. I uh, hope it's not in a situation like Saturday, you know, where it gives the team field position, you know, really deep in your territory and makes a difference. In a close but game, yeah. In a close huge, game. Huge difference. But he was confident today. I think it was sincere. I know Clement's confident in him. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's fine Saturday. I'm not sure if I'm concerned about it or not. It's definitely something I want to keep an eye on going forward. But you certainly have to love the approach by both Clement and Philip Brooks to yes. it so far. Especially Philip Brooks has never really met with the media mm-hmm. at any point in his career, whether it be last year or so far this Second year. Second dude to walk in today, too, and, after and he, that. And, yeah. and he came – his first, his first time he comes yep. out is after probably his worst game in a Kansas State uniform. Yep. So that's Impressive. something, that's something to be said for that. Absolutely. Um, let's move on to yeah. segment two. I mean, obviously, we have uh, this was presented to you by Legacy Insurance and People State Bank. We're gonna go through the Big Twelve, pick all those games, get Logan Mance in this <laughs> podcast a little too. bit, yeah. and then we'll finish off by picking the K State game and telling you our keys to the game and stuff like that. So stick with us here on the KSO Show. We're back with segment two of the KSO Show, brought to you by People State Bank and Legacy Insurance from Tallgrass Tap House. Bourbon and Baker and Harry's also sponsor this segment. All three of those places on this um, on the street. Tell, tell, tell me what you guys ate today from Tallgrass. I had we had well. I haven't eaten here for like for us for a little while, yeah. but I had the fried chicken sandwich with what I get here. It's a classic, ninety-ish percent of the time. <laughs> yep. but I thought it was really good today. You guys got the same thing though; it was really cute. <laughs> yeah, I got the cheese stick. I feel the cheese stick. I, I was impressed. <laughs> I yeah, got no, water. it was good. It, Logan said he got <laughs> water. Yeah, I, I told him he I should said he'd get food. He's like, nah, I'll just get water. Blew off, the, <laughs> blew off the free food, man. <laughs> Come on, just being um, polite. Yeah, just being a good guy. Uh, so yeah, let's let's go game by game in the Big Twelve and pick them. Should be a little fun, we'll you make know. Logan go last so he can hear us, <laughs> yeah. and then try to like Price is right it and guess what sounds <laughs> yes. better to beat us. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, boss, the first game of of the week is Friday, which if you're listening to it, this on Friday, which you probably are, it's today, tonight at six thirty. <laughs> <That's the most laughs> <confusing. laughs> Take two tonight. Kansas plays Boston College. Kansas, yeah, <laughs> Kansas goes to Boston College. A little Big Twelve ACC matchup. Obviously, Kansas has looked just. Good. The, the, uh, the darlings of the Big 12. My goodness. <laughs> one and one team. I mean, at least they did get past Indiana State for them. They did rally to beat the Sycamores. Um, but poor, Boston College, a 2-0 and o team. I was going to say, those poor Sycamores couldn't beat Dayton the following week, though. <laughs> they lost to Dayton, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, Dayton. Yeah. Day- I tell you what, you lose to Kansas, you kind of just your season falls apart. You don't even care anymore. You know know how many scholarship players Dayton has? Mm, Not a lot. Zero. Zero. It's a non scholarship program. (laughs) Listen, those are kids. (laughs) Those are heady kids, though. Those are gym rats. Those are coaches' sons. Those are guys playing for the love of the game. (laughs) All that stuff matters, Dy. And I know you're trying to just dismiss it, but because you hate everything from Ohio for some reason. But Dayton, (laughs) but Dayton's got a lot of heart. A lot of the Flyers. So there you go. Let me give background real quick. Boston College did. They started their season off with an ACC matchup, beating Virginia Tech at home 35-28, to and then beating Richmond pretty handily 2-0, and taking on KU. I mean, this would be a pretty easy pick. I don't care who starts. Off. I'll, I'll go, but what's the line? Um, the, the line I saw was, I think, 23. i got to go back to it. Are we 20, picking the line or the team? We just, we pick the team. It, just picking it like but, I mean, it's fun up. to throw it out. 21 is the line. I, yeah, bet, pick, let's go I bet KU covers, but Boston College will win. Uh, I picked KU to cover last week. You know, some point favorite, and they lost outright. Um, so I'm not going to pick them to cover in this one either. Uh, but I just want to make it, take a second to less miles, man. On Monday's Big 12 conference, the first question, you know, asked him about the rebuild, and his, his response is, uh, we weren't surprised, you know, by the outcome, and we weren't going to win every game for five years. And I thought to myself, man, there's a lot of space between going undefeated for five years and losing at home to Coastal Carolina. <laughs> like, you could do other things. Um, I would take Boston College to win and cover. Me too. Boston College you, to win and oh cover. Oh, yeah, Logan's yeah. going last. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. Don't forget about me. <laughs> um, I'd go definitely Boston College because I think uh, Les Miles gets his first real butt whooping. Yeah. Yeah. Of his coaching career. The yes, first major absolutely. one. Yeah. <laughs> last week wasn't, you know, wasn't a whooping. This one, yeah. Oh, well, he's going to get that Alabama whooping this week. Yeah. 
Another uh, Power 5 matchup. North Carolina State going to another rough team in the Big 12 so far. West Virginia. 1-1 West Virginia. 2-0 NC State DY. I think this and will also line. be a blowout. Okay, so he's six and a half is the line going NC State's I, way. So. I like the Wolfpack big. I watched a couple of Wolfpack quarterbacks last Sunday, and my guy Philip Rivers and Jacoby Brissett for the Indianapolis <laughs> Colts, who looked pretty darn stellar. Uh, both looked good. The Wolfpacks look good. West Virginia's terrible. I would also take NC State to cover. Me I'll too. go NC State. Again. Yeah, so all four of us are Wolfpack. taking the Wolfpack. I. I, I wasn't alive for it, but man, remember those Wolfpack teams? You probably do those basketball Wolfpack teams that used to, you know. I don't remember. You mean like the famous one? Yeah, like, the Valvano. One. I don't remember. Like I, no, I, I was. I just come on, da- maybe I, yeah, that, was my, that was my dad. I was five telling me years about, old right. when that happened. That was my man. dad tell- taking me back. to those I was days. not. That happened in the mid '80s, but I would have had to have been born in the '70s for that to know. I wasn't born in the '70s. I was born in '81. I was offended that you think that I, I think remember maybe those I teams. confused maybe like a Houston team. You ask me about like the Bart Star Packers <laughs> or something next, you know? <laughs> Len Dawson and the Chiefs. They beat Houston. It was the, you're thinking of the same team again. Same team. It was the, they beat, Houston. Yeah, they beat Absolutely. Houston. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember them either. That's so. awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think my earliest like college basketball teams I can tell you I remember would be like the Larry Johnson UNLV team like 1990. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking of my dad. Shout out to Steve Landers. Correct. Um, <laughs> Oklahoma State headed to Tulsa, staying in the state, obviously. One and one Tulsa, two and zero Oklahoma State. Been looking all right so far. Tulsa's got a pretty good offense. It'll be a high scoring game. They'll keep it kind of close. Oklahoma State wins though. I feel very similar. I think Okie State wins by a few scores, but I don't think it's one of those, you know, forty four nothing before you know it. I bet it feels competitive for a little while. I bet you Chuba Howard. If I pronounce that right, I think you actually <laughs> did. I think you're one of the only people who actually says Chuba, which is correct. I think like, he runs for a million Chuba. yards. <laughs> one million. <laughs> the Cowboys At get least. the win. Yes. <laughs> Cowboys get the win. Credit, for, say, sure. credit for saying Chuba Hubbard, right? Because I still say Chuba. I don't <laughs> Chuba. care. Best running back in the Big 12. Ooh, is he? Wow. I don't know. I mean, Trey Sermon and Kennedy Brooks might have something to say. I don't know. I mean, that. it's not crazy. It's not Puka crazy. Williams also. I mean,. <laughs> Puka's offensive line will have something to say about that. I mean, yeah. James <laughs> Gilbert's run for 100 yards back-to-back games. God, I love James Gilbert so uh, much. Chuba, Chuba Hubbard, I agree, actually, with that. No, I don't. We're just showing how many backs we need. We're trying to impress <laughs> you. you know? like, <laughs> what about Sewo Alalua? What about Khalil, uh, that's, that's what about Khalil Herbert? Oh, Khalil Herbert, the backup for Darius Kansas. Anderson. Um, <laughs> next uh, game, next game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Iowa, ni- number 19, Iowa. <laughs> Sioc. <laughs> yeah. The Hawkeyes game day. headed to so- the uh, – Two aims to take on the Cyclones. Very upset. Good for them. Game day is in Ames. One in in Iowa. They've obviously dropped on the top 25 with still a win because of their not impressive performance in week one. Who did they play? Uh, I forgot. It was like, I think it was South Dakota State or something. Let me see. No, you're thinking of Minnesota. Northern Iowa, they played one by three. Iowa State. That was Iowa State. Iowa State played. Oh, you're asking if Iowa played. Isn't that what you said, Iowa? I think you said Iowa, but you meant Iowa State. Iowa State, Iowa State now, did fall now, out of the yeah. top 25. And they did have a rough week. Right? Iowa You're right. has been good. Okay, no, we're on the same Handling page. Miami and handling Rutgers two weeks in a row. I was going to say, I don't think Iowa's giving up a point. Yeah, I remember them struggling, but Iowa State sure did. Iowa uh, did. Yeah. I'm taking Iowa. State Iowa. Did. Yeah, I don't care if you're I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I, there's no way I can pick TJ Iowa Hawkinson, State. and Noah Fant. Yeah. They're all in the NFL. George Kittle. Tight end you. Yeah. I'm going with the upset. I'll take uh, Brock Purdy, <laughs> the Cyclones. I got the Hawks. Technically, I don't even know if it's the upset. At least what in Vegas, it's two. It's bounced going, back. Or no, it is. Iowa. It's two to Iowa. So, I'm getting it all mixed up. So, it is yeah, two to Iowa. Hey, this game's tough for you. It started out Iowa State. I'm, I'm taking Iowa State as well. So Thank we're you. split. Yeah, no, we're Landers. split two Thank and two you. on this. Young one. guys love I, love Brock. <laughs> I have a feeling Iowa State turns it around big time, and they end up being a, a top five program in the Big Twelve. Wrong. Jeez. Um, <laughs> what did that all come from? I don't. Like, I just, we've never shared that. Th- I mean, I'm just giving you a gun right now, but we've never had that conversation. I know. It's You're just like yeah. Well, it got asked on our chat last night. Monday night, oh, yeah. check out well, our chat. <laughs> or, <yeah. laughs> for, for those of us who remember, yeah. a quick story. So, like, we had we had a chat Monday night at seven thirty, and I've never, <laughs> never <laughs> forgotten it. Never. I'm always I'm early to it every time. And about I don't know what time it was. We have a little group message. Eight forty five, I think. Almost nine o'clock. We, I was I'm laying on the like, I'm just laying on the couch, watching the game with Nats, talking to Red, not not a care in the world. And Flanders like texts me like, "You okay, Daily?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm fine." <laughs> and I didn't even—I I forgot it so much I didn't even know what you were referring yeah, you're, to. <laughs> you're like, probably like, "It's like, yeah, so what? Are you looking through our window right and now." I'm, like, I'm <laughs> thinking about—I'm thinking about like I even went, I went straight to the site. I'm like, "Is something going on in the site?" And I'm looked at, 
And I'm like, looked at the front page, like, no. And then I looked at like Twitter to make sure nobody like did anything crazy. And like, no, like, what are you guys talking to me about? And I was like, the chat that I was two hours late for. And uh, I texted Flando. I was like, is is he okay? Yeah, I was, I was, I like, was doing fine. Oh, yeah, I just noticed that he hasn't been answering questions. Let's yeah, see. yeah, I felt good about myself. When it, and then I didn't want to tell Nats. So, like, I just silently grabbed my computer. You know, and I didn't want to admit to I'd forgotten for two hours. But let's pick this game. Sorry. Oh, yeah, next game. Sorry, next I lost game. my spot. So. Well, I, I know Keep why. Talking. I rambled for a while. Uh, we were talking Iowa State losing to Iowa. I would say it was uh, TCU. Claymore, another. Tim Dwight. <laughs> TCU was an, was an underdog at, in this game at one point, but Sindelar for Purdue is out, and now the line has swung back in their face. Two and a half to TCU, another Power 5 matchup in the Big Where's 12. this game at? It's uh, Where is Purdue? What, what is West that? Lafayette. West Lafayette. West Lafayette. It's at Purdue. Yes, at That's Purdue. That's all I needed. I, well, I like to I know the cities know the anyway, city. so maybe I do. Sure. I want to know. And guess, I will uh, take to learn Alex, something on the podcast. Guess uh, TCU's leading rusher. Dairy is it Alex Delton <laughs> right now? It's got to be yeah, Alex. It's got to be. It's got to be Alex. Alex. Seven carries, 67 yes. yards. 67 yards is their leading. Have they only played one game? Yes. They okay. Have. Because I was, oh. he, had, like, he had that in game one. Okay. So, well, we yeah. played Interesting. One, I will take the Arkansas Pine Bluff. I will take the Horn Frogs just because if Gary Passion's playing a quarterback in his first game, I like TCU's chances. Uh, Purdue has arguably the best rival site in the network. I'm not kidding. They do a great job. So I want to pick them for that reason. But they already lost that game Nevada at the start of the year. I can't do it. I think TCU, probably behind Max Dugan, gets the win. <laughs> I like Sindelar, and I like their uh, wide receiver, Randall Moore. He was like a five-star recruit at one point. Yeah, I'm taking, I'm taking the Boilermakers. Ah, Boiler Ooh, up. Got to hope Sindelar plays. Boiler He's down. Boiler 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 up. Boiler yeah, down. If he He's plays, I got Purdue. <laughs> I'll take Purdue regardless, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I really need to know nothing about either team. You know, they, they lost at Nevada, and I'm sure Sindelar was there. Too. He called him Sindelar. <laughs> he has no clue. If you're going to gamble this week, do it based on Flanders' picks. And then go. Oh, and then and then at home against a tough Vanderbilt team, <laughs> just crushing them. I just think at home, it's going to be a close game. I think Vanderbilt gets the win against TCU. <laughs> Listen, everybody, let that, everybody let that. Everybody let that. Purdue. Yeah. Yeah. Purdue. I same was colors. Tell you all don't same, <laughs> same colors that threw me off. Like, they're very they're similar. The colors. The same color. yeah. Like yeah. Oh, I'm just all Purdue over the place. and Vandy Iowa. are the black and gold equivalent of Oklahoma State and Oregon State. Yes. Same colors, same thing. Yeah. But still no excuse for no me. No excuse for you. also the deadest And again, let's back up. <laughs> Flanders not running the board this week, just so you all know. Yes. He is focused only on this. It yeah, doesn't, it I know. Doesn't, it doesn't know Purdue's quarterback. It's confused him with Vanderbilt. Oof. <laughs> but, I, but yeah, I still think I'm doing the best job I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oklahoma. Number five, Oklahoma, headed to an 0-2 huh. UCLA team. 22 and a half is that line. Oh, that's going to be uh, not – not hide your children for that game. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be ugly. It's hide be, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> OU covers faux show. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take OU to cover. Yeah. Yeah. Four that's Sooners, huh? Do you think Chip Kelly will just quit after Four that game? <laughs> nah, he's going to make that money, man. I mean, like, he's going to hang around and pay him as long as they'll let him. Next. Another note about money is I was reading Les Miles' contract last night, and it sure reads like his buyout – is the amount left owed to him for the rest of his contract. So if he has four years left and he gets paid $2.7 million a year, it's four times 2.7. <laughs> There's not a specific buyout number. It's whatever's left on his contract. So he's probably going to be in Kansas for a good long time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, good for you, Jayhawks. Uh, number 12, Texas. <laughs> Staying in state, headed to Rice. Obviously coming off a... a it's at a, Rice? Yeah, it's They're at Rice. On it, the very road. interesting. You know, it's probably one of those things where they get to, like, you know, rationalize. Oh, look, we're playing on the road, but it's still a home game because it's in Texas and that kind of thing. I thought that Oklahoma you know? line was big. 31 yeah. and a half towards Texas. Well, Rice almost beat Army in week one. And then Army almost beat Michigan in week two. So by the transit of property, Rice still loses big. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Texas' offense was more explosive than I gave it credit for last week. I thought they'd put up 13, and they put up in the 30s, I think, against LSU. Um, I think Rice would – 31's a lot. I know nothing yeah. about Rice, except they're, it's great if you're hungry and want to eat a million of something. That's a joke <laughs> I heard somewhere. And um, I think Texas wins big, but Rice covers. I'll go Texas. Yeah, Texas, but Rice covers as well. I'm with you on that. Last game before we pick K-State – um, Texas Tech headed to Arizona, another Power 5 game. Mm. One and one Arizona. I mean, Pac-12 has not been very impressive this season. Two and a half line going Tech's way. 
on the road. Tech has actually been firing on all cylinders under Matt Wells, just like Kansas State under Climb, and it's pretty similar. Yeah. They're probably playing a poorer opponent this week than, than K-State. Arizona's kind of been rough for the entire tenure of Kevin Sumlin. So well, I actually think Texas Tech can probably win this game. Hardest game so far, which makes sense because the line's really close, yeah. and I'm not biased against you know Texas yep. Tech like I am Iowa State, so it makes that harder. <laughs> I'm going to pick Arizona um, just just based on being at home. And I think, you know, Texas Tech has been impressive so far, and I'd be zero surprised if they won. But uh, I thought they slowed down a little bit in week two, even though, like Derek said, they were still basically dominant. I'm just taking Arizona as a flip of coin. I'm not a big fan of Cleo Tay. He always finds a way to like, lose a game. I used to be a, a fan of him. Yeah. He, always, he always finds a way to lose a game. So I'll go Texas Tech. You saw that Hawaii game week one? <laughs> Yeah, at Hawaii, Khalil Tate had the chance to rush it in there. I know, didn't get it done. Feels like he's been there forever too. Yeah, it does. the hype around freshman Khalil Tate was yep. real, you know. And Texas Tech, yeah, on the road gets the win. Um, it's time to pick K State. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we won't do it yet. First, we got to do keys to the game for K State, which I like to go to Dale first on this. So tell me your keys, three Ooh. keys of the game. I mean, I haven't written this yet, so this has all got to come off the top <laughs> of my key. Normally, I can cheat off of this but it would be offensive line how will they perform against that unit defensive line how they perform against that unit (laughs) and i'll probably look at skylar thompson you know like i've said a few times i think for case i think k-state can run a little bit against them i don't think it's gonna be some scenario where k-state can't run the ball at all i just think for k-state to win skylar thompson's gonna have to throw for that 250 to 300 range and i think that's the key so the play of the two the two offensive the two lines offensive and defensive and then can Skylar Thompson go get a, a marquee victory as a junior starting quarterback? I'll be pretty similar. You got to be able to run the ball because that's what everything revolves around when it comes to how the Kansas State offense functions. And if they run the ball well, the way they they have so far, they're going to keep Mississippi State's offense off the field, and that's going to be pretty imperative in this game. Mississippi State's given up over four yards of carry against two very subpar teams. So if we uh, was it Louisiana and Southern Miss? Mississippi State. Yeah. Uh, Lafayette. Was it Lafayette? Was it Lafayette? No, it's Louisiana because they just call them Louisiana okay. now, I think. Okay. And Lu- then Southern Miss. Yeah. If Louisiana and Southern Miss are averaging over four yards a carry, Kansas State should do better than that, and that should be enough to keep Mississippi State's offense off the field. So that'll be a pretty big key. And the defensive line, if they want to have any chance, they can't get blown 30 yards off the line of scrimmage. You want to you uh, pick three? I mean, I you can do it. Yeah, a couple. Three. Give us like one. Yeah. I'll just give you one. Yeah. Um, tackling they got to tackle uh yeah. hill he's like leads the what college football and missed tackle yeah he's making, forced, yeah you know, yep. missed tackles that's all so. stat there yep even better than james gilbert so so tackle that's i don't believe it <laughs> well i mean that's a great one though i mean they didn't tackle him very well last year when i talked yeah. about concerns he about is. the secondary he tackle is. him he's going to get the secondary some logan's right like can they bring him down because i mean typically that's better than letting him score Usually, yeah. yeah. K-State's going to have to do that. I, I, I skipped this one because, you know. That's you okay. Got, well, you're the host. You're not supposed exactly. to analyze. Exactly. You, you guys evaluated it well enough. For, uh, I don't need to chirp. Chirp in. <laughs> <laughs> top players now. <laughs> Go with Dale again and give me a top player either side of the ball for K-State to pull this out. Just to be different because, I mean, the answer is obviously for me, Skylar Thompson, because of what I think he's going to matter. I'm going to say Adam Holtorf. I think him, even more than Tyler Mitchell, has been very good this year. And you could argue about it. Or Nick Kaltmeyer has been very good. Um, looks the most different to me. And I want to see if he can, you know, be that guy and be physical against this Mississippi State team. So I'll go Adam Holtorf. K-State center needs to play really well on Saturday. Jordan Brown's probably going on offense just because they're going to they're gonna have to run the ball. And if Dale's right and he's kind of the, the sneaky weapon that, you know, hasn't been able to bust out that can, then that'll be a pretty – you know, big thing to have for Saturday and defensive wise. Maybe trade to Sean. He has, oh, he has, he's doing two. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. One yeah. for each side of the ball. That's yeah. a trade to Sean defense because well, he's stealing mine. No, I'm just kidding. Defense awesome. tackles have to play great. Right. Jordan Mitty was great last week. I want to see trade to Sean play up to maybe all Big Twelve caliber. That's what some people consider him yeah. as before the season. I'll go Malik Knowles. Um, obviously, got to catch the ball. I think he's the best K State wide receiver they got, and they got to be able to throw the ball. Like you said, yep. one of their keys is running the ball to set up the pass that would help no doubt since, since you said a defensive tackle i'm going to stay on the defensive side too and i'll go walter neal this week as we talked about earlier is he gonna be able to tackle a, a hill that's running down um the sidelines <laughs> yeah <laughs> i hill. wanted to see what you're gonna do with that yeah <laughs> but but yeah that's gonna be the uh, a player to watch he's gonna have to make some big tackles so 
Let's pick this game. I mean, this is this is exciting. This is like one pressure pick, pack. Like. It Honestly, is pressure pack. The first two weeks, like I thought K State was gonna win, and if I got the score a little bit wrong, I might hear it. But it's not you know that big of a yeah. deal. But like this is the first time I have a chance to really make somebody mad at me, you know, or to make a big mistake uh -huh. or be wrong. Um, I will pick Mississippi State thirty to twenty. I think it's a significantly more competitive game than last year. I think in the fourth quarter, K State had a chance to win the game. I just, I just. I think I said this to Kurtz when we were just hanging out the other day. Like, if we really believed the talent gap was so wide last year, and we did, that I don't think that should have changed enough in this, you know, this year-long period since that last game to go on the road and beat them. Yep. Um, doesn't mean it can't happen or that Chris Kleiman can't be the difference, and it won't happen, but I'll take Mississippi State 30-20. to 20. He's right about the talent gap. If it's as much as what we saw last year, then it's hard to imagine it closing in enough for Kansas State to win because of how dominant Mississippi State was a year ago. And if it is, that shows you how good of a coach Chris Kleiman is to, to be able to make that dramatic of a change this quickly. I'm still going to go Mississippi State. I got a 30 to 24, so really similar to Matt. I'm going K State yeah. 28, 17. Ooh. What are you going to do? So Flando is usually the guy who comes in all, all young <laughs> yeah. and full yeah, of energy and picks it. the cats. I and love it. Been done already. Well, it's another split. I'm taking the cats, and I'm going to say I haven't even thought of a score yet. I'm going to say 28. To 24. I wish you'd have said, do you say 28 17? <laughs> yeah, I, I was hoping you said 28 17 <laughs> so bad. I mean, the good news is you guys who both picked K State to win both picked them to score 28. Derek and I, who both picked K State to lose, both had Mississippi State scoring 30. I mean, so if we see a 30 28 final, we're going to say we're really smart. Yeah. And but that would mean a loss. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it right that's there, it. guys. Uh, book it. K State gets the win in Starksville. <laughs> you heard it from the Young Bucks. <laughs> Where's Mason? He needs to be on here too to join. He would have picked him too. I know. Right. Um, so yeah, that wraps up this podcast. <laughs> I'm saying podcast. This KSO show brought to you by People State Bank and Legacy Insurance. Tallgrass Tap House sponsors it as well, along with Harry's and Bourbon and Baker. Derek Young. Yeah. Matt Hall, Logan Mance, running the board. I mean, he did a heck of a job. If, it's, if it sounds yeah. better than other ones, that's the difference. We're not even making right. sense up. If and it sounds he's, better, he's got to be there every the time. <laughs> if it sounds worse, don't tell us because we'll feel bad. But what can they tell? Who can they tell? What should they do? I don't get it. Tell your friends.